drinking pints were over a drink, we have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. It's the final official day of COP. And will there be an agreement, an agreement that could affect all of our lives, an agreement between 196 countries? That's a question we'll be asking throughout the show and indeed throughout the day. Don't worry, we've got some brilliant guests coming up. We've got the head of policy at Net Zero Watch casting, casting a sceptical eye over what is going on here at COP. We'll also be talking to the managing director of a Formula E team. That's right, an amazing electric Formula E car. Uh, in the background of that shot, it's going to be great. Um, also, we're going to be talking to the, to the head, to the founder and indeed editor of the Guido Fawkes website about some pretty extraordinary news. The Batley and Spen by-election result is being challenged. All that and so much more coming up in this programme after your news in five minutes time. I'm Rhiannon Jones. This is your news at nine o'clock. A new draft of the COP26 agreement has been published as the climate summit enters its final scheduled day. The new proposal appears to back away from a call to phase out coal and fossil fuel subsidies completely. The draft is likely to undergo further negotiation at the talks, which are meant to finish at 6 p.m., but could overrun. Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, says Boris Johnson should return to Glasgow for the talks. Labour's International Development Secretary, Preet Kaur Gill, told GB News that we're nowhere near where we need to be. In nowhere near where we needed to be on halving the global emissions. We're actually putting our planet uh, on, ta on track, as, as you've seen from the reports. For me, certainly, I want the two biggest emitters, China and the unit, US, to really back the calls of developing countries to say we can't wait and delay, you know, until another two years. 1,000 people reached the UK in a single day yesterday and a new record for the current migrant crisis. Rescue operations worked well into the night with some of the boats that were intercepted carrying up to 50 people. Yesterday's total will surpass the previous single day record set earlier this month. The Queen will attend the Remembrance Sunday service at the Cenotaph but will miss the General Synod next week. It's believed this will be the first time she's missed her five yearly visit in its 51 year history. The 95 year old monarch was ordered to rest by royal doctors just over three weeks ago and spent a night in hospital last month undergoing preliminary tests. A former aide to the Prince of Wales has resigned as chief executive of the Prince's Foundation amid an alleged cash for honours scandal. Charles's former royal valet is accused of promising to help secure a knighthood and British citizenship for a Saudi billionaire donor. Michael Fawcett had temporarily stepped down as chief executive of the Prince's Foundation in September. He's now resigned from the post. Julian Assange has been given permission to marry his partner Stella Morris at Belmarsh Prison. The WikiLeaks founder has been held there since 2019, while the US continues an attempt to extradite him. The couple met while Assange was living in the Ecuadorian embassy. They have two children together. They've taken legal action against the prison governor and Justice Secretary Dominic Raab, accusing them of preventing the wedding. The husband of Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe is beginning the 20th day of his hunger strike. It follows a meeting with Foreign Office Minister James Cleverley, one that Richard Ratcliffe says left him feeling deflated. He's accused the British government of not doing enough about his wife's continued detention in Iran. Speaking ahead of a vigil tonight, Mr Ratcliffe said the Foreign Office strategy wasn't working.
I mean, I said to him at the end, I, look, I come away with no hope. Um, I, I felt that in your strategy, um, you, know, it's, you know, it's all carrots to Iran, there's no stick. I can't see what's stopping them from continuing to play games with Nazanin. Um, I think by being here, you know, Nazanin's probably safe for a few weeks. But what's to stop them threatening to put her in prison again? Lord Patel says new leadership will be vital in driving the change that Yorkshire County Cricket Club needs. His comments follow the resignation of Chief Executive Mark Arthur over allegations of institutional racism. Lord Patel said Yorkshire needed to rebuild the trust of fans, the cricketing world and the public. And you may want to rethink or you may want to think twice before buying a gift card this Christmas. A consumer survey by which found that almost one in 10 people received a voucher over the last year for a retailer that's gone bust. 38% were then unable to redeem the full va balance of their voucher with an average of 25 pounds left unspent. They're advising shoppers to avoid stores in administration which may refuse to pay out. I'll be back Back with the headlines in half an hour, but for now, it's back to Tom and the briefing. Good morning and welcome to the briefing live from Glasgow here on the final day of COP26. Well, while we're here at COP26, we've been trying to bring our audience a broad array of views here uh, at COP26. We want to be a, a broader spectrum of opinion than potentially other news channels are. We want to speak to as many voices as we can. One person who I tried to speak to yesterday was Nicola Sturgeon. However, she wasn't having much of it. Despite giving interviews to other channels yesterday morning, Nicola said that she could couldn't answer my simple question about nuclear power because it was Remembrance Day. Let's have a little look. Nicola, Tom Harwood here from GB News. Just wondering, are you considering lifting your ban on nuclear power? Are you considering lifting your ban on nuclear power, Nicola? Of course, but uh, before that, do you have any thoughts on nuclear power? Why does the Scottish Government ban nuclear power? Is it an important part of the mix? Now, sadly, I was brushed away by her security team there, but I think it is an important and growing question. Why does the SNP Green Scottish Government ban new, new nuclear power in Scotland? It doesn't seem particularly green, and it's a pertinent question to ask here at COP26. Nicola, this is an open invitation to come back on the programme whenever you feel ready to answer that question. Well, there's been lots else going on here at COP26, and one person who has been scrutinising everything going on is Harry Wilkinson, who's head of policy at the Net Zero Scrutiny Group. Well, to get a different take on what's been going on here today, I caught up with him earlier in the week. What does success look like at COP26? Well, I think the first thing to bear in mind is that you have all the world's governments here, and so they have a collective vested interest to portray whatever happens uh, as a success. And the other thing to think about is actually we've got these commitments, but how are those commitments going to be translated into action? The UK, for example, has said net zero by 2050, but we don't really know how to do that. There's going to be huge costs involved. Um, and, and a lot of the people here at this conference come from quite uh, wealthy background and it will be the poorest people in different countries paying the costs of climate change policy. So yes there will be costs of climate change happening but there's also going to be costs of climate change policies as well. So the proof in the pudding will be can we find a way to reduce our emissions that protects people's jobs, maintains their livelihoods um, because at the moment they're talking about things that like heat pumps which leaves people's ha homes colder and with higher energy bills. So those aren't the kind of technologies that are going to deliver that fast transition, which will happen if there are market-friendly uh, approaches to this. So that's the kind of uh, uh, way that I'll be looking at how the, the, uh, what's agreed at COP is then translated into policies in all the different countries. 
I've been quite critical of some of the more disaster movie type scenarios that have been uh, projected by many people at this event. Although one of the reasons that I've been critical is that I'm generally quite an optimist. Uh, that when, when we look at sort of how technology has developed over the last decade and the price at which uh, loads of different ways of generating energy has come down and indeed uh, our, our ability to use fewer resources to produce more things has gone up. Up, doesn't it? Doesn't 2050 net zero not seem so unrealistic when we take into account all of that amazing technology change that is no doubt going to happen? Well, there's huge reasons to be optimistic. The current generation who are being scared about climate change are actually the safest generation ever in terms of their risk of dying, dying in an extreme weather event. So there's good news all around uh, and, and there's this really unhealthy apocalyptic attitude that I think you're quite right to change. But yes, we should be optimistic about technological developments in energy too. Um, and I wouldn't rule out net zero by 2050 as being possible, but it's only going to be possible if we have the right policies in place. And what, we're, what we've seen is governments picking winners. Uh, we've seen £10 billion a year currently goes to backing up wind and solar. So that's in excess of the market price that they receive for energy. And what that means is people's energy bills are rising. That bill is going up and up. We're told the cost of wind and solar are coming down, but actually the price is being paid. And in the financial accounts of these companies, we can see that the costs are quite high. And we've got the fundamental problem that these technologies don't provide reliable energy. This comes down to, can we keep the lights on and do the technologies that we have to deliver that generation when it's needed? And wind and solar, however cheap that they claim it is, um, it can't deliver that reliability at the moment. So we need new technological developments happening. And the environment that that needs to happen in is a competitive environment because governments historically have been terrible at picking winners. And there's no reason to expect they're going to have got any better. In, a, in any case, the evidence is that they've got worse. So uh, we need an actual canny approach. We need a market-friendly approach. And that means making hard choices. That means we can't just... Uh, subsidize our way to net zero. That is the road to ruin um, and we need to look for alternative approaches. But I'm not seeing that at COP. I'm seeing a very sort of socialist agenda here. I'm seeing an agenda that's focused on reducing people's consumption of all sorts of things. Um, and so that's really disturbing. No, it's quite concerning to me to see people saying that, for example, people should have fewer children or reduce all of the benefits of life. Um, how are you finding the reaction to someone from Net Zero Watch here at COP26? Well, it's been uh, an interesting place to come. The Viper's Nest from someone who's actually critical, who asks questions about how these policies are going to be delivered. I was just walking around and it sort of reminds me of a sort of Scientology forum. You've got these people in suits promising that we need to listen to them if we're going to be saved, but we're going to have to pay them a lot of money to do it. And the, the one group of people that come away quids in are the people preaching this gospel. So it's, it's a bizarre place. I was walking around, I saw some deep diesel generators behind, or what appears to be diesel generators, that will obviously have to be confirmed with careful analysis, but they were hidden behind black screens. So what they were doing hiding these behind black screens, uh, your viewers can uh, speculate. No, it's fascinating. It's fascinating walking around this place. It's also interesting to hear other points of view as well. Harry Wilkinson, thank you so much for joining us here on The Briefing on GB News. Black screens hiding diesel generators here at COP26. You couldn't make it up. Harry Wilkinson there from Net Zero Watch, giving us a different perspective. Well, I took a little walk around some of these negotiating rooms yesterday where the real detail is being worked out, away from the, the flashy spinning globes and colourful rooms. It's a bit of a different side of COP. Let's take a look. We're entering now potentially one of the most boring bits of COP26. That's right, away from the frivolity, away from the pavilions, away from the exhibits. This is where the real work gets done. We're walking now between the meeting rooms, the rooms where negotiators, and we can sort of peek into this room a little bit here, just we can't, they've closed the door. This is all very secret. This is all very important. These are the negotiating teams of various countries trying to agree a grand global agreement by the end 
end of the week. We don't know what's going on. There aren't even windows in the doors. We get little hints throughout the week, throughout the day. But really, when it comes down to it, the shape of the agreement, what is actually being decided, we won't know that until the end of the week. One of the interesting things about COP26 is that it's not policed. In fact, all of the COPs around the world aren't necessarily policed by local policemen. The UN fly in their own policemen from New York and from Geneva, which is why you can see quite a few of them walking around with guns on their holsters. Now, why do they do this? Well, it doesn't make sense necessarily in a country like the UK, where there's an established and respected police force, but in some other parts of the world where there may be less uh, reliability with the authorities, uh, it makes sense to have this across all cops. The meeting room area has its own map. I mean, my goodness, how many meeting rooms do you need? Going right down through to 21. Well, just a little bit of a look in the areas where the cameras don't usually go. Indeed, we tried to have a look inside those rooms where there are sort of big, uh, big oblong shaped tables with different country signs on them, but they, they close those doors so incredibly quickly. They don't want us peeking in. Well, to park COP for a second, there is some extraordinary news out this morning. The Batley and Spen by-election result is now being challenged in the High Court by George Galloway. This follows an extraordinary report revealed by the Guido Fawkes website showing that Labour MPs were using their parliamentary offices to conduct canvassing operations remotely. Now, this seems to be against electoral commission rules. You have to declare expenses in by-elections, and that includes declaring office space that you've used, office space that is funded by the taxpayer. This is, of course, all coming after uh, Angela Rayner submitted uh, a complaint against Geoffrey Cox, the Tory MP and QC, who appeared to be using his parliamentary office while conducting work as a QC, while conducting legal work. Now, Labour say that's very much against the rules, yet the Labour politicians have been using their parliamentary offices to conduct campaigning work in a by-election. It raises a lot of questions, and I'm delighted to say that I can be joined now by the man who owns the website, who runs the website, who edits the website that broke that story that led to this High Court's challenge. Paul Staines, welcome to the programme. Now, George Galloway is a man who has had a bit of experience in the legal system before. Does he have much luck here? I'm angry about the uh, Batley and Spain by-election, and I think he has reasonable grounds to challenge the very private... Now, there are two rules in play here. Every new... ...because of what you can... I'm very sorry. I'm going to have to interrupt here. We have seemed to have a bit of a bad line. We'll try and re-establish that connection. But from what I could make out, Paul Staines, of course, of the Guido Fawkes website, was making an eminently sensible point there. The Batley and Spen by-election was won by just 323 votes. And that means that only in reality around 150 people would have had to switch their vote in order for the results to be a different way. Potentially, a phone banking session like that could have made all the difference. Well, while we try and re-establish Paul Staines there, I'm delighted to say that we can now uh, speak to someone who is incredibly important in the world of Formula E. That's right, Formula E, not Formula One, but electric Formula One cars. Uh, I caught up with Sylvian Felipe, who is managing director of Envision, of Envision Virgin Racing. Envision Virgin Racing there, and uh, he told me a little bit about what's going on in the world of electric vehicles. Firstly, how much of annual CO2 emission comes from the automotive industry? Well, um, the way we look at it is transport in general, so if you include freight and all sort of mobility, uh, is around 30% of the problem, basically. It, it changes depending, depending a bit on the country, but roughly 30%. And, and 
moving to more sustainable transport, moving to electric vehicles specifically, seems to be something that this COP seems to be much more on board with than in previous years. Is this a real turning point for humanity right now? Yeah, I think it is. Um, from an engineering and technology point of view, I think, funny enough, the transportation sector is probably the easiest one to solve. Even though everyone driving electric cars seems a bit far away from here, the technology is already here. Now in Formula E and our prototype here and with the Envision team, we are basically working on technologies that will make electric road cars in the next two, three years, absolute no-brainer. Like they will be, for people who like fast cars, they will be faster, they will be cheaper to run than internal combustion, no maintenance, more reliable, better in every single way. So electric cars are going to dominate the whole transportation sector and we have the technology today. So that's why I think you can see this increased momentum is that we know how to do it. And of course, when these cars are powered by renewable energy, which is the case in more and more countries, then every year the same car is getting greener and greener because the grid is getting greener, which obviously we cannot do with a petrol engine. So that's why you can see such a strong direction. Now, when these cars first came about, these Formula E cars, these electric Formula E cars came about, the batteries had to be swapped out in the middle of the races. Now, these batteries will last a full 40-minute race. Does this show that potentially on more ordinary, everyday cars, the ranges will be getting longer and longer as well? You're absolutely right. Like, so in the beginning of Formula E, we had two cars per driver, and now we can do 45 minutes or more, 50 minutes or more with only one car and one battery. So we've basically doubled the amount of energy in the space of three years, which is shows you the rate of progression. But also these power trains are incredibly efficient, so we're also working on that. Uh, and basically, you're right, what it means for road cars is that already the case now, to be, uh, to be honest, you have many, many choice of many cars that can do 250 to 300 mile range pretty easily. Uh, the next few years is really mostly to decrease the cost of it, because actually not many people need 500 or 600 mile range anyway. You will have fast chargers everywhere. That's actually not too difficult to do, so it's definitely coming. So the question will be, this 300 mile range kind of benchmark where you need to be, make sure that most cars have that and reduce the costs. And that will be done by the increase in, in battery, in the, the, what we see here, increase in battery technology. Um, that means better energy density. So specifically, what do you want to come out of this COP? Do you want more investment from governments in terms of R&D into battery technology? Or do you want more infrastructure spend or just more general agreement in terms of this is where the market should go? I think it's both, but I'm very optimistic around transportation because the private sector, car manufacturers, suppliers and so on are already well, well ahead. It's happening. Like a wave of electric cars are coming, the cost of manufacturing is going down, and you'll be flooded with electric cars coming to market very soon. Um, of course, what needs to happen is better infrastructure. Again, it depends on country by country, but for sure that needs to happen. It's actually not too difficult to do from an engineering point of view. It's a question of budget, return on investment, and political will, but that's definitely going to happen. Um, so yeah, that, that's it. And then in terms of uh, big objectives for COP, I mean, our humble contribution here is purely to get people excited, right? Like the future, a uh, net zero, carbon neutral world doesn't have to be a world where we are restricted in what we do. And transportation and cars is definitely a world where we can actually look at something better than what we are doing now. So that's the idea behind the, the electric racing cars. So banish the doomsters, banish the gloomsters and look at the marvellous cars that could come about in just the next few years time. That's exactly that. Yeah, Get people excited about the technology. Sylvian Felipe there, being positive, being enthusiastic, being optimistic. That's what we like to see. Well, I'm sorry we can't establish pool stains. It seems to be a bit of a tough connection. But I do want to show you the image that the Guido Fawkes website uncovered, showing all of these Labour MPs and indeed one Labour staffer using parliamentary offices in order to do campaign work. And this was undeclared in the Batley and Spen by-election. You can see that on your screens there. Do check out that story on the Guido Fawkes website, an important one and one that potentially exposes a little bit of hypocrisy. Well, moving on, yesterday was, of course, uh, a day that focused on building, on how we can construct infrastructure in order to combat challenges of environmental change and indeed help limit environmental change. I'm delighted to say that I caught up with Rico Volotilovic, who's from the uh, House Builders Association, who told us a little bit about how housing fits in to that net zero puzzle. How does housing fit into this net zero puzzle? Well, it, it's integral really. Uh, it's everything. Uh, we've been fighting quite hard for planning reform and a lot of people think planning reform means deregulation and just houses built more quickly. No. <laughs> planning reform really is delivering homes more quickly, uh, better place making, net zero at the heart of it, but in a sustainable way. 
currently have a system whereby all the biggest companies build all the homes and that makes things really complicated for your smaller builders. Uh, I represent smaller builders so of course that's pertinent to me but actually smaller builders are key because if you want to level up you can't do it without small builders. Seven in ten construction apprentices are trained by uh, small and medium sized enterprises so without them you can't level up but they build your smaller sites within your communities where your net zero better transport situations lie. So that is real placemaking. And why planning form is so important is it changes the landscape of land. So this is a bit complicated, I guess, but local authorities are the ones that decide where homes get built. They allocate sites. So if they want 2,000 homes, they go 1,000 here, 500 here, 20 here, 30 here. We need them to be a bit more strategic. So 20, 30, 50, 100 with inside the community. So you can really plan for net zero solutions, for better placemaking, for more strategic housing and employment opportunities outside, so your growth zones. So that's why planning reform is so good, but it's been taken away from us. And really it's because the opposition parties and unfortunately conservative backbenchers haven't really had an honest debate about what coherent place making and planning is. Now clearly there's a big lack of homes, clearly there's a housing crisis and the prices keep going up and up but there's also a slight opportunity here perhaps in terms of redesigning the way that we live our lives, having houses for people that want to live in cities that are more accessible for cities that need fewer internal combustion engines or anything else to get about the place. How close on the horizon horizon is a potential solution? I don't think it's that close because I don't think lo local authorities and politicians understand the challenge. So take something like the humble flat. You know, really we, what we can deliver is really great places. So you have your balconies, there's a bit of outside spells, you have your roof terraces, you have a community built. We don't do that. We build homes just to house numbers and actually what we need to do is design better and that would encourage people to say yes I, I'm happy to have high density or low density or medium density so you can actually have a better place currently we've got this situation whereby it's a battle on numbers and we need local authorities to grasp, grasp the metal and say actually we are going to support good design and you know that's good for the city centres but it's also good for the smaller and, and rural communities outside because we often forget about them and the government's got this weird obsession at the moment with pushing all the houses up north and I get it because we need to level up every region but the north is consistently building 200-300% of their minimum housing need it's the south where we're not and the three worst local authorities are living less than 36% of the housing demand are all in the south and southeast so the reality is we need to really understand what this is about. It's about design, it's about placemaking, it's about enabling the right homes and the right people to actually build and get access to these homes. And this isn't only a climate problem, this is a political problem, particularly for some of those Tory shires outside of London. They're finding that many, many younger people, potentially people who are more aggrieved at their renting situation, people that are more likely to vote for potentially opposition parties, are moving into those Tory constituencies. Uh, are the Tories waking up to this? I don't think they are. Um, I uh, live in Brighton and Hove now, I moved from Birmingham a few years ago and when I bring up the conversation that let's expand, for example, we've got a green council, let's expand outside our city limits so we have more active and public transport corridors, so you know, you're walking, you're cycling and you're, uh, maybe a tram service in the future, wouldn't that be nice? So we can bring more jobs to Brighton and Hove rather than letting the 60,000 cars a day leave there is opposition because they say, well, you can't build on the green belt. Well, how on earth can you bring people in? Um, and actually, that's really bad for the Conservatives because it just means that those people think, well, we're not really going to be interested in voting Conservative because there's none of these... I don't really like the word, but the working class jobs. You know, I think people are waking up to the fact that if you want to work and get on, actually, the Conservatives are the party for you. And some people obviously struggle with that. But I think that's a reality that we've seen in the last five years especially. And the Lesser Conservatives recognise that. And the working classes aren't just people that live in London. This is the problem with the debate. Housing crisis is not just about the South East as the South East and London. London is London. The South East is your rural communities in between, your coastal communities. Brighton is a perfect example. It's a coastal community that's focused on a commuter belt to London. It doesn't think about Eastbourne, about Hastings, it doesn't think about Portsmouth and Southampton and Worthing and all these places in between. That should be our regional strength. We don't recognise that because we are so obsessed with upsetting the political apple cart. Remove the politics of planning and we get a much better system. And if you want proof of that, you look at, everyone should look at their self-build register and get on the self-build register. I guarantee you will not find a, an opportunity with your local authority via your cell phone register despite you identifying exact local need that they want. That just proves how endemic the politics of planning is.
And so potentially what's happening with the planning system right now is you're having people living where they might not necessarily want to live, having to travel far greater distances than they'd like to travel because they can't live in the places where potentially the greatest demand is and where the houses are needed. 100%, yeah. Um, uh, and it's an interesting conversation really to be had about something called the road uh, investment strategy. Um, it's called RIS2 at the moment. And I've been fighting for a long time against the anti-road guys because what we need to do is involve public and active travel on those new projects so that in the future they're well connected and that we have a better, more coherent, planned community and region. This is the point. It's not just about one city, one area. It's about a region. So you're right. If you really live in a rural community, where are your closest jobs? And if you're saying no to the houses in that local area, because it's a bit of green belt on the edge of your community, well, where are the jobs going to go? You needed houses and jobs. So once you say no to the green belt, you also rule out both of those things. And they're the things that really make sure your communities are connected not just, well, we'll build up north, because that's not the way the system works. People want to live and work close by, and also has so many knock-on effects, you know, whether it be childcare, support from your local community, where you travel, whether it's go going by car, whether public transport is accessible and affordable. So building out your communities, is a, organic growth is so important. Now, another issue that ties into this just finally seems to be insulation. When people hear the word insulation, they might think of people gluing their faces to roads, but actually it's something that is quite important, that can save money for people and that new builds might well have a good idea about. How does this all tie in? In terms of new build, I don't think people should worry too much about insulation. Perhaps we've got some concerns to make over air tightness, so the amount of air exchange there is in a building. And that's actually not dissimilar from retrofit. So if you want to retrofit homes and you want to put more insulation in, there are very cheap things you can do. If you want to do a full retrofit, like the face gluers are talking about, then, yeah, that's going to cost you upward of £80,000. But we need to have a real conversation about what we can do to just do the cheaper things that are, that are possible. We don't really have that conversation. And we've been fighting with the government to really get them to appreciate what a national retrofit strategy would look like. And that's one solution, but they need a policy that allows us to retrofit. So, if you, so a great example is seven million homes have got uh, no cavity walls and 1.2 million homes are in conservation zones. That's a third of our housing stock that are really hard to insulate. So while we could put heat pumps in them, and, and they do work, they, you know, they, they are a good technology, they might be other approaches we need to consider. Mm. And at the end of the day, some people say, stick in a heat pump, brilliant we can just keep creating renewable energy well that's not really the solution we need a long-term solution because energy prices fluctuate but the, the warmer your house is at source the warmer it will always be it's a fascinating discussion and something that potentially doesn't get talked about enough in the conversation of net zero in the conversation of environment how we build our environment really really matters thank you so much for joining us here on the briefing on gb news Riko Voltovich there from the House Builders Association on how we can approach net zero from other more positive angles and hopefully one day, maybe, fix the housing crisis. Well, that's it from me this morning at COP26. Tune in for our special programme at 2. What, if anything, has COP26 achieved? Has it all been for nothing? We'll be exploring that in detail at 2pm. Coming up next, it's to the point. Uh, and so tune in for that after some messages. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. 
And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints were over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. I'm Rhiannon Jones. Here are the latest headlines. A new draft of the COP26 agreement has been published as the climate summit enters its final scheduled day. The new proposal appears to back away from a call to phase out coal and fossil fuel subsidies completely. The draft is likely to undergo further negotiation. 1,000 people reached the UK in a single day yesterday and a new record for the current migrant crisis. Rescue operations worked well into the night, with some boats carrying up to 50 people. Yesterday's total surpasses the previous single-day record set earlier this month.